I'll be honest with you, and this is going to sound critical, but um, people just don't, but when they have this condition, they tend not to believe that it's from cannabis. <laughs> Uh, thank you for talking with me, Professor Russo. Um, I don't know much about what what is it? Uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome is that how to pronounce it? Yeah, hyperemesis or hyperemesis. Um, yeah, you know we prefer the term cannabinoid because this has actually occurred with other agents, some of the synthetic. Uh, cannabinoids like spice and K2 um, can also provoke this. Uh, so it's related to activity at the CB1 receptor, like from THC. Um, it's unclear whether you can get it with just CBD. As you know, most CBD preparations have some THC, and so uh, that's something that hasn't been uh, cleared up yet. My suspicion is that if he had a pure cannabidiol preparation, that it wouldn't provoke this. So the theory is that it has to be uh, heavy use uh, that that does this? Yeah, you know, there may be people that straight out of the chute have problems. I've heard of people trying cannabis for the first time who get sick. Um, but, you know, without knowing what their natural history is down the road, it, it'd be hard to say. But the most common scenario is that somebody uses cannabis, gradually uses more. Um, what I'd say is that this is almost always associated with people who have developed a tolerance um, and are using larger amounts over a period of time. However, and this is what one of the things we can't explain yet, once this is this is established, it's like people are sensitized to it. So if they quit, it will abate. However, when they resume, often even a small amount will trigger uh, it again. So, you know, there's the possibility of some conditioned responses, but, you know, this isn't a psychological condition whatsoever. Right. Uh, that's another one of the allegations that's just proven false. Something I want to emphasize, can't be emphasized enough, is this should never be taken as evidence that people shouldn't use cannabis. Not everybody who uses cannabis is susceptible to this, and this is one of the things you want to emphasize. You have to be at risk, presumably having uh, one or more of these mutations that make you susceptible to getting this condition. Okay, so, so it's kind of like an allergy, not, you know... Uh, cannabis isn't for everyone. Some people can have bad reactions to it due to allergic uh, reasons, and some people uh, could be genetically predisposed to the CHS. Is that what you're Correct. saying? Correct. Yeah, okay. that's true. So the genetic theory, is that proven or is that still a hypothesis? Uh, depends on how we want to look at it. I mean, we have very strong evidence. Um, you know, we've seen five genes that have statistically significant 
incidences as compared to, uh, you know, our control group is very carefully chosen. We use people that had heavy intake of cannabis, um, but didn't have the symptoms. So we weren't comparing these to anybody off the street, rather people who you think might be prone to getting this, but they're not. Um, so, you know, they're distinctly different. The chances that those differences are spurious, uh, next to none. Um, you know, if this had been one gene, I, I guess it could happen. You'd have to look at the numbers, but with five different genes, all of which have a plausible explanation in relation to the phenomenology of CHS, it really makes sense that this is the cause. Um, we believe that. It's true to say that, you know, we'd like to generate more numbers in the future and learn more about this. So we could say, look, if you have two of these or three of these, you've got it for sure. Um, uh, if you have one with this pattern, uh, you might be at risk. You know, it, but, uh, you know, this isn't the last word. Okay. However, we, we really believe that uh, this is the explanation. All right. Now, uh, do people experience the symptoms of uh, CHS who do not use any type of cannabis or th synthetic cannabinoids at all? Do people uh, just no. vomit for no reason? Sure. So, you know, there's a condition that gets confused with this. Uh, called cyclic vomiting syndrome, but it, it's distinctly different. Those are people that often begin in childhood with just out of the blue episodes of, of nausea and vomiting. Um, and then later as they get older, these get associated with migraine headaches. So it's what we call a form first uh, of migraine, uh, you know, and, uh, sort of form in development. Um, and interestingly, people who have cyclic vomiting syndrome have found that cannabis is helpful to them. And this also creates confusion. Uh, it's exactly the opposite with CHS. When people continue to use cannabis, they're going to provoke symptoms rather than alleviate them. Now, obviously, um, there's some contradictions in the minds of people because it's common knowledge that THC in cannabis has an antiemetic effect. That's why people use it when they're getting chemotherapy for cancer. Um, but here, uh, it's obviously the thing that triggers episodes, and it's extremely difficult for people to accept that. Um, I'll be honest with you, and this is going to sound critical, but um, people just don't, but when they have this condition, they tend not to believe that it's from cannabis, and it, it, you know, it's like an obsessive uh, fixation that it can't be that. Um, but uh, you know, as you see in the paper, um, there's an explanation for that. The, the couple of the genes that are, we saw with these mutations relate to the dopamine system, um, so they're associated with a higher risk of both addiction and possible development of psychosis. That doesn't mean everybody's going to get it, but at least we can say that um, they're more susceptible. So, you know, uh, apart from the, the tie to cannabis usage and the warnings that we've got to issue for somebody that has symptoms and would test positive, the importance of what we demonstrated is also that, look, you're at risk for other stuff. You're at risk for alcoholism. You're at risk for nicotine addiction. You're at risk for uh, dementia when you're older and also heart attacks and strokes. So uh, there are a lot of what we call comorbidities, um, related susceptibilities to other disorders. So it's a bad thing. Yeah, um, we should take know, it we, seriously. And, and it's added to many reasons why you should use cannabis in moderation. Sure. Um, I, I do want to try to eliminate, I guess, one of the myths that you have uh, pointed out that people, uh, because um, pesticide poisoning has been linked to vomiting and this condition is linked to vomiting, 
that some people might think, oh, well, maybe it's uh, some sort of pesticide problem. But yeah, well, you know, on that one, I just try to point out to people, look, I've been a crusader against uh, pesticides in cannabis. Um, but I've also seen pesticide poisoning and what it looks like, and it's very distinct. Uh, sure, you know, uh, on the surface, it may look like there's some uh, com commonalities, but the symptomatology of uh, organophosphate, particular, uh, that kind of uh, pesticide poisoning is, is really distinct from this. The other one, and this one pains me because I use neem on my fruit trees. Mm. People have tried to link it to neem. Well, mm. you know, along the way, I intensively looked at toxicity associated with neem. It's really very little. Um, I mean, I've eaten, I've sprayed with neem and eaten the fruit the same day. So, you know, if anybody would get it, it would be me. Well, well, um, I, I've, I've done a bit of research on cannabis soils or the soils that have been sold to cannabis farmers and the uh, contamination. Um, so uh, it's my understanding that uh, not all pesticide poisoning symptoms are the same. Like, say, neem pesticide poisoning symptoms might differ from microbutanol poisoning sure. symptoms has anyone ever written like a comprehensive review of all the different pesticides that uh, are typically uh, found in contaminated cannabis growing in and the different symptoms that might arise from that yeah i've got a table in an article uh that i wrote a few years ago i'll shoot to you after this can i, I uh send can i provide all the links that you've uh, given me to uh the uh, people at Cannabis Culture and Pod TV that might be watching. Yeah, our... the the ones about the uh, genetic article that's open source. Okay. The letter to the editor is not. Okay, um, don't share that. Um, you can share the the other one. Okay, um, the first one. Yeah, uh, the other one actually probably hasn't been in print yet. Um, but that was just for your use. Okay, so just for and, me. Yeah. Okay. And this other article, I have to see uh, where it was, whether that's open source or not, but I'll send it to you as soon as we're done. Sure, thank you. Uh, it is coming from a perspective of me who's kind of a corporate skeptic, and uh, I've seen um, this movie I called... I, 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 I just want to, you know, say it so it can be pushed aside, but uh, there was a recently a movie out with uh, Mark Ruffalo in it called Dark Waters, and it showed about this huge machine that prevented anything being done about uh, no-stick Teflon poisoning that people were getting. Uh, oh. And then there's this other example in Cosmos, uh, this uh, series by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And, and, and uh, one of the episodes was called The Clean Room, and it, it talked about this huge corporate machine that prevented anything being done about lead and gasoline and we still have this problem with um, radioactive chemical fertilizers in uh, uh, being used to grow tobacco in and that there was this uh, uh, kind of in the early 80s there was this research that suggested okay this is the primary reason why people are getting uh, cancer from smoking tobacco is these uh, polonium-210, lead-210, and radium getting uh, taken up into the leaves and and then uh, finding their way into people's lungs. And, and there's still no heavy metal uh, standards in either tobacco or cannabis in, in Canada, the United States, and growing. There's no, there's no organic standards for growing. And it just makes me wonder, uh, could there be uh, a kind of a machine, a big uh, influence of a corporate influence on academia that prevents uh, the uh, investigation of, of the full uh, effects of chemical pesticides and chemical fertilizers on cannabis growing. And, and could, could there be uh, efforts to kind of not fund the type of, of uh, research that could prove or disprove that theory? Well, Real quickly, I mean, I've written uh, this article decrying uh, uh, heavy metal contamination of pesticides. Um, additionally, uh, I, you know, the study we just did, I funded personally. Oh, okay. I, so that's you. That's uh, I paid, 
Ethan Russo from his bank account. Nice. Ethan study. There was nothing corporate about it. it it's it's mentioned under the rubric of Credo Science, but that's my company. Oh, okay. Good. But, it's good to know. Uh, just for the record, we're about two years in here. I haven't taken a cent in salary. Yeah, um, I hear you. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a lot of volunteer uh, academic work myself. Uh, well, if you, um, I, I'm going to pass on this information. You have a, a webinar coming up uh, in right. like a week or so. Yeah, uh, next about, Thursday. And then people can participate if they want to ask you questions about this and learn more about uh, CHS. This would be uh, the way to do it. I'm going to uh, pass on this information to uh, Pod TV and Cannabis Culture, and hopefully we can get people signed up to your webinar. Now, if you ever want to uh, do anything more about uh, chemical pesticides or chemical fertilizers, I would also like to uh, give me the heads up because that, that's something that I think uh, more could be done uh, to regulate them out of existence and, and just have organic standards. Yeah. And well, even I'm, I'm organic right standards that take into account the fact that neem could also hurt people if, if, uh, if, if it was smoked. For example, rather than eating. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be something we'd advise. But uh, again, I'll just tell you that in relation to the article that I'm going to send you, yeah, uh, this was done in Washington State. Um, I had really lofty expectations that this is going to gather more notice, and particularly that we were going to get it mandated in Washington State that everything that was sold in the dispensaries had to have uh, full assays for uh, pesticides, but it didn't happen. And again, there was sort of a sweetheart relationship there between some of the producers and the people on the board, um, and they avoided uh, mandatory testing. So I was pissed. Yeah. Um, it really didn't get the traction I was hoping. And it wasn't, a, it's not about me. No. You know, this no. is a genuine public health issue. Yeah, well, I, I think... Uh the, the the powers that be tend to favor regulations that create exclusivity and tend to disregard regulations that a might actually help people and b might cut into corporate profits sure sure okay well on that note thank you very much for your time it's uh short but punchy just uh send me another email with all the links that i can share all together and then I won't share anything other than that, and that way uh, we can keep doing this and keep having a good relationship. Okay, super. Thank appreciate you very much for your time, Doc, uh, Professor Russo. I, I really appreciate your work and all your uh, volunteer hours you've, you've put into this. You bet. Have a good one. Yeah, you too, man. Cheers. Cheers.